half in the bag. So, it's only a few weeks now to the big day. That's right, Mike. You know, I can't wait to marry Mr. Plinkett. Thanks again for the delicious cake. Uh, I don't know why you keep feeding it to me. Well, Jay, in my home country, it's tradition for the groom to eat a whole cake every day for six months leading up to the wedding. So do they still have a wedding cake on the day? Oh, no, no, no. By then, the groom would be sick of wedding cake. <laughs> oh, do they replace it with something else? I'm sorry, what? Do they replace the wedding cake with something else, some other tradition? What are you talking about? Oh, tradition. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that thing that you're lying yeah, about right now. Right. right. Uh, oh, I think it's a pig's head. Oh, that's great. I love pork. Oh, fuck. Hey, what's that? That was a close one. <laughs> close what? Nothing. You know, it's really great that you and Mr. Plinkett are so much in love. Yeah, it's weird. You know, I have vague memories of you and me planning this wedding as a way to inherit all of Mr. Plinkett's money after he dies. But over time, I've grown to love the old curmudgeon. Well, now that it's been confirmed that you are indeed marrying Mr. Plinkett for love and not money, I took the liberty of drawing up a prenuptial contract for you and Harry to sign. It's really just to protect you legally. Wow, Mike, that's great. You know, you think of everything. You're such a good friend. Yes, I know, I know. The contract might look a little bit intimidating because it's so big, but I urge you, sit down, take the time, and don't read it at all. Just go to the last page and sign it, and have Harry sign it as well. You don't think I should at least skim it a little oh, bit? Oh, no, no, that's not important, no. You, you, it's all very boilerplate. Mm. Standard prenuptial contract, nothing sketchy or illegal or criminal or weird or amoral or anything like that. What were we talking about? Yes. Oh, have you seen the new movie The Disaster Artist? I have. Well, let's talk about that film instead of talking about this shady prenuptial contract. When I get up on stage in front of people, all I can think about is, what if they laugh at me? You, man, you're fearless. I want to feel that too. I don't care. I'll do it. The Disaster Artist is a movie about an eccentric weirdo outsider that writes and directs his own film, which turns out to be one of the worst movies of all time. You know, kind of like Ed Wood. Just without all the heart, style, memorable characters, charm, or wit. That's all, bye. Damn, that's cold. <laughs> Milwaukee winter cold. <laughs> Mike, what did you think of The Disaster Artist? Um, I didn't, I didn't love this movie. I didn't hate it. I thought it was okay. I was expecting something a little more. And I only really chuckled at the parts that were directly related to the room. Yes, and that's a bit of a problem, because i that's kind of most of what I laughed at, too, which is a laugh of recognition, which is not what you want from a movie that should stand on its own outside of the room. No, its attempts to stand on its own felt ham-fisted and schmaltzy and probably unrealistic, or, or not really what happened. Right, well, for the not, most part. not being what really happened is fine, as we talked about in our Ed Wood uh, review. Uh, True. But what Ed Wood does is it, it transforms itself into its own thing that works as its own movie, regardless of how uh, accurate it is to what really happens or whether you know the source material or whether you know anything about Ed Wood. Mm. And, and this movie really doesn't. I was trying to watch it from the mindset of someone who maybe isn't familiar with uh, The Room or The Disaster Artist book, which I've read the book, we've seen The Room many times. We, as a matter of fact, have a commentary track for the room. So I was trying to watch it from that mindset and I was thinking, why is Greg doing anything he's doing to help Tommy in this movie? He has absolutely no motivation. He comes across like a simpleton. This kind of works as like a dumb buddy comedy, I guess, until halfway through when Tommy turns into a raging asshole on set and it gets horribly awkward. It's it's a very uneven movie. Yes, uh, buddy co comedy sounds about right. Because you're really dealing with three different things here. You're dealing with The Room, The Disaster Artist book, and now The Disaster Artist movie. And each one, it's its own different thing. Yeah. 
And yeah, uh, unlike Ed Wood, Ed Wood is a masterpiece. It's flawlessly done. It's perfect in every frame, every shot, every scene goes in the proper order. It makes complete sense. This jumped all over the place and it felt, it, it gave me this like horrible feeling of anxiety the whole time. And I think it was partially the camera work. The, and the, the documentary style. There was that and, and then it was like, there was no loving joy. There wasn't, you know, like he was like, Mark, you and me, we're going to be a filmmaker. We're going to make the Hollywood dream come true. Yeah. And there was no like, there was no like awe of that, that, that dream, that spectacle. Because you have that moment in Ed Wood when he meets uh, Orson Welles. Ed. Yes. Visions are worth fighting for. Why spend your life making someone else's dreams? And you know, Ed just kind of looks up to the Hollywood idea, the icons, the the glitz and glamour of it all. This has just felt like a dirty alley. Well, in that, that uh, Orson Welles scene, uh, I guess we're probably gonna end up comparing this a lot to Ed Wood, but that scene is critical story-wise because that's what gives Ed the motivation because he had quit his movie at that point because everybody was trying to you know, take over his vision. And so he's like, that's it. And he storms out and, and Orson Welles gives him the motivation to come back and finish the movie. And that's what leads into a, a wonderful conclusion. This movie, it just kind of fizzles out. They just sort of stop shooting. Him and Greg get into an argument on like the last day of shooting. And it doesn't feel like the movie is building up towards anything. That was a real, real clear end of second act moment. Sure, was, but then They he get just, in a fight for no real reason. Yeah, and then Greg, he just comes back and says, Greg, come to the premiere. And then they go to the premiere. And then the movie kind of ends. Uh, uh, Greg Sestero motivates Tommy. He helps Tommy to build him up, and then Tommy helps build him up. But then, then they have in the awkward uh, sexual sexuality component too, which further complicates things. So it makes the movie kind of, uh, I don't want to say a mess, tonally a mess. I, I just uh, say unfocused. Emotionally. I, I, don't know, I don't know, like a lot of it feels, I mean, it definitely feels like James Franco wanted to make this movie because he wanted to play Tommy Wiseau. Sure. And he's a wonderful Tommy Wiseau. I think he's actually really good in this. But you need that director with a vision. And he directed this movie, James Franco, who has directed 27 other movies that nobody's ever heard of. You could tell they just wanted to make a movie about what happened behind the scenes of making the room because they wanted to recreate the room. Because at the end, after the movie's movie proper is over, they have side by side comparisons of the room and the disaster artist. You are tearing, tearing me apart, apart, Lisa! And it's like, okay, this is fun, but I, I it's kind of pointless. Yeah, I could not give a fuck how accurately and specifically you recreated the scenes from the room. No, that like that, that doesn't. There's no heart to that. Like, yeah. Good job, I guess. But the the problem is though is is that um, they tried to make the heart. Tommy Wiseau, and they played around with that idea that is he the villain or is he the hero? Yeah. Because he, he himself was wondering that. He's like, I am not the villain. They have the part in the, you know. Bob uh, Odenkirk's Bob cameo Odenkirk's, where he says he yeah. should play Frankenstein. Yeah. <laughs> you have a malevolent presence. You are a perfect villain. I could see you as Dracula, Frankenstein. I'm not Frankenstein. I'm hero. Obviously, if you have the rights to this book, Tommy signed off for that. And if you want to make a movie, Tommy's got to sign off for that too. So you're not like, we're going to portray you as a fucking monster that everybody <laughs> hates. Okay, maybe one scene. I go a little crazy and I fight with crew. But in other scenes, I'd be happy. I'd be like James Dean. You know? And it's like... In the book, uh, in Greg Sestero's accounts of what happened, Tommy was so, not just during the making of the movie, but even leading up to it, he's, he's manipulative, he's an asshole. And the reason Greg agrees to do the movie is completely for money purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a struggling actor, he has no money, and Tommy Wiseau is going to give him a, a pretty hefty salary to do this movie. That's his entire motivation for doing the movie. In, in the, the movie version of The Disaster Artist, he just does it because they're friends, I guess? Because Tommy's his best friend. Because Tommy's his best friend. <laughs> yeah. It's as shallow as The Room. Greg and Tommy, he's my best friend. Ironically <laughs> enough, <laughs> it, it, it's true. Yeah. You know, we both have this dream. Yeah, I guess we do. That <laughs> <laughs> we'll be famous. We'll show them. Watch out, here we go. There is the weird homoerotic kind of relationship between Tommy and, and did, did Greg uh, ever live with Tommy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
I, I would say the homoerotic aspect of it is amped up in this movie, which is really oh, creepy yeah. since they're brothers. But by eliminating so much surrounding that, it is very much that like there's no motivation for these two to be friends. And uh, I mean, it seems Tommy's motivation is clearer. Um, it's almost like a, a sycophant friendship where Tommy Tommy is like strangely either in love with Greg or or in love with the idea of wanting to be Greg. He wants yeah. to be the all-American handsome male actor, but he's, you know, an ugly man and he's weird. And right. that's something he wants to be. He may not necessarily be like sexually attracted to him, um, but he wants to be him. And Greg wants to be an actor and Tommy provides the means of possibly doing that. So they're not really friends. They're yeah. two parasites that have attached themselves to each other. And that does not play out in the movie. It comes out, you know, they, we follow our dreams. Uh, and, yeah, you know, it's, it's like, very simplistic. Mm, you needed Todd Salons to direct this. <laughs> you you well, needed you can go da David Fincher or uh, like da when David Fincher made this, The Social Network. I mean, that was all psychological. Oh, like, God. You know what I mean? Like, that, that, well, there's two ways you could go about it. And that's the problem. This movie's right in the middle this went, of this mediocrity. Went, yeah, it went, you can went make it a real broad, goofy comedy mm -hmm. or even like an Ed Wood kind of, you know, romanticized comedy. Heightened realism. Heightened realism. Mm -hmm. Or you make a weird psychological... I was thinking of Boogie Nights during the scenes when Tommy's flipping out on the set of this movie. It, like, oh, it kind sure. of reminds me of the, the, the porno scenes from Boogie Nights. So you could do that version. It was a blend of all those different things that you just mentioned. Yeah. It kind of had a heightened reality a little bit to the, like, a certain degree. Because um, I was really expecting, like, more of the behind the scenes, the making of stuff. And just uh, more of, like, the technical details that went on behind the scenes they, they touched in a little bit here and there like we they didn't he didn't give them water yeah it's personal bathroom um just it would have been nice to know what's going on in the minds of all the other actors in the movie that too i mean we yeah. have julia daniel who plays lisa in the room i mean she's such a huge part of the room and she's barely in this there's one scene their sex scene very necessary i need to show my ass to sell this movie i think you're aiming a little bit i am what i am just do the scene why is he having sex with her belly button they'll lead up to their sex scene and she's just like it's okay i'm fine what is tommy's freaking out on set and walking around naked it's like what is she thinking during this scene but they just completely gloss over that she's trying to be professional yeah but they had that, that i like that little moment when the uh claudette is is saying why she loves acting and then they're all kind of sitting around. They, they all kind of bond and laugh at this is this, what is going on in this movie. It makes no sense. You know? Right. And so more moments like that would have been better and less um, uh, uh, Tommy and Greg. But I know they're the leads. And so it becomes kind of like a, a focus issue. Curiously enough, the movie opens, I should say oddly enough, the movie opens with a bunch of current Hollywood actors all saying why they love The Room. People like... Um, uh, Adam Scott's there. Adam Scott. Um, Kevin Smith. Kristen Bell. Yeah. It's a bunch of, uh, yeah, you're just like, okay. Which, again, I was trying to think of like someone seeing this that isn't familiar with The Room or the Disaster Artist book, because they're not saying the movie is so bad it's hilarious. They're saying like it's this eccentric guy and he Change had a vision. Yeah. And it's like if you're watching this, you'd be like, what? Like, yeah. like he, no, he made one of the worst movies of all, one of the funniest bad movies of all time. You have to establish that up front for people that aren't familiar. Yeah. If that's the way you're going to open your movie with these talking heads. But it feels more like, oh, here's James Franco's friends. It's that culture level. It's, it's James Franco obviously loves the room in the way that you and I love the room. Right. It's freaking hilarious. <laughs> it's, it's incompetent. It's amazingly bad. But then there's there's the darker psychological weird level that that which you the, get out of the book, which you get from the book, where where it gets really into detail about all these little things Tommy does and and what is wrong with his persona. Yeah, um, that's a whole nother movie, and so I think it's a filmmaker problem where James Franco might not have been the best choice to direct. I think it was just the style. Um, it's just very surface level, a, a surface level version of this story. Surface level with the, the beats and plot points of a Hollywood buddy comedy where, go, where you and I have a dream, we make movie, 
look at what we've done. Yeah. Uh, we failed, but really, in the end, we won. It's a very truncated version of the 10-year the history of the room in one screening, the premiere screening of the room. Yeah. Which, that scene, and this is, it brought out something from the recesses of my brain that I didn't even know was still in there. Because they go to the premiere of the room, uh, which starts out very funny because it's so awkward where the movie's playing and it's terrible and it's like the cast and crew and you know whoever else shows up to this premiere and the movie's terrible so people start like snickering or trying not to laugh and that was like the best thing in the movie is, is the the awkwardness and then once they start laughing more more overtly Tommy starts to get upset and everybody's laughing hysterically and he storms out of the theater and he's in the lobby and then uh, Greg Sestero comes out to comfort him, like, oh, they're laughing, but that means they're enjoying the movie. There is a scene exactly like that in an episode of Doogie Howser, M.D. <laughs> because Doogie Howser's best friend wants to make movies. Do you remember his name? Vinny. Vinny. Who, uh, that actor was in Ed Wood, oddly enough. So there's an episode where Vinny makes a movie. It's like a horror movie. I think I remember that. And they have a screening of it in, in someone's house. And everybody starts laughing hysterically. Stop it, Mary Sue, do you hear me? Get a hold of yourself! <laughs> I'm sorry, Pete! Don't worry, Mary Sue. And Vinny runs out of the room and he's horribly upset because everybody's laughing at his movie. And Doogie Howser comes out to comfort him. Listen to that. I mean, they're laughing. And me. And tells him, it's okay, they're all enjoying the movie. And then they go back in and everything's fine. So this movie, The Disaster Artist, has the emotional depth of an episode of Doogie Howser, MD, from 30 years ago. Well, I give them job, I give them salary. I'm gonna spend $5 million on this movie, Greg. Five, are you kidding me? $5 million? And what? they are not grateful. Nobody respects my vision. I like Seth Rogen. He's fine. Everybody's fine. So, I, the, I I did not like uh, Dave Franco. No. One, he, I mean, not that he has to, but he doesn't look or feel anything like Greg Sestero. Right. Uh, Personality-wise. But also, like, if you've seen the teaser trailer, which is the I did not hit her, I did not scene where he can't get the lines right, and Dave Franco's off to the side, and he has this sort of, like, uh, like perplexed but, like, concerned look on his face. That's him through the entire movie. There's, there's no range to him, really, at all. I'm trying to think of how you would portray Mark. The, the only real hiccup is how you portray Mark is also how you portray Tommy. Because in this, Dave Franco's very, like, he's very apologetic. He's very, like, nurturing. Like, oh, just give Tommy a chance. He'll be all right. Come on. Yeah. Like, like, Which is awkward. And, and real life, uh, Greg Sestero is probably like, He's embarrassed by him a lot. This movie would have been fascinating if Tommy Wiseau was portrayed probably closer to what he really was. And that, I think it was the, like, the, the handicap of it. This set of the alleyway looks exactly like the real alleyway out there. That's right, that's why we're doing Hollywood movie, right? Well, why don't we just shoot in the real alleyway? Because it's real Hollywood movie. No, yeah, sounds good. Okay. I would have liked to have seen a version of this story told where it doesn't there no concern for the real Tommy was so or a version of this movie that's just like really funny and clever right because it can you can soften him I mean we talked about Ed Wood obviously yes. they, they ignore the fact that he was an alcoholic and he died penniless mm. and you know I'm sure he was a bit more of a, an asshole at times on set than they portray him in that sure, movie sure. so you could do this kind of soft best friend version of this movie but this doesn't really work as that either because you do have those awkward moments where he, he is an asshole on set. He's never an asshole or like manipulative outside of that, the way he is in the reality of the book. So it's just sort of like, bleh. Let's yeah. celebrate the room. Then just go watch the room. Then just go watch the room. I think the problem is just that as its own thing, it's not that good of a movie. It's, as just, it's, it's yeah. just clunky. As its own thing, you don't really want to root for Tommy or you don't really want to root for Greg. They're both sort of unlikable, and Tommy was t Franco as Tommy. It was it was okay for me. It wasn't great. I, I liked him because that was when I heard they were making this movie. I was like, just cast Tommy Wiseau as himself, like because I don't want to see somebody doing an imitation of Tommy Wiseau. You can't do that, and so he doesn't seem to be doing a direct. It seems like he's just trying to capture the essence of him without doing a direct, mm -hmm. complete imitation, which is the way to do it. Sure. Um, 
so I, I did like him a lot in the part, and I don't really like James Franco in most things, but I would love to see his performance of Tommy Wiseau in a completely different version of this movie. Action! I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. What the f- it doesn't work if you're looking at the camera! It's a shame, though, because ironically, we saw this at the world-famous Oriental Theater uh, in Milwaukee. I, I've seen the room, like, I don't know, four or five, six, seven, eight times. All and, at the Oriental Theater. All at the Oriental Theater, and that's famously when we went and met Tommy Wiseau. Uh, we shot a little video about it. Um, he groped me. Oh my God, don't worry. You're manhandling me. Yes. Um, we tried to get Tommy to say, you're tearing me apart, George Lucas. <laughs> And he said he knew the guy. Why George Lucas? I know the guy. I know the guy. <laughs> and we compromised on, you're tearing me apart, George. You're tearing me apart, George! And then that same theater is where we saw the disaster artist. So All these years later, it's full circle. It's come full circle. We've seen the disaster artist, seen the room 17 times, met Tommy Wiseau. And as I say on our commentary, close the book. Well, I was gonna say, zip it up. Close the book, closing the chapter. Yes. The last chapter. So Mike, would you recommend The Room? Or The Disaster Artist, whatever we saw. I don't know, I'm, I'm torn between saying, if you've never seen The Room, you might enjoy this, because I, I can't tell, I don't have that perspective, and I never will. But as a person who's seen The Room and read most of The Disaster Artist, um, I found the movie a little frustrating because I wanted it to be more like the book and it made me want to go watch The Room again. Mm. And so really like, I kind of wanted it to be over <laughs> a, a lot of the time. So sure. I think that might be a, like a no recommendation from me if, you, if, you've, if you're a fan of The Room and you're a fan of the book. I don't know, it's hard because I, I, I laugh at the parts when you know, they recreate the scenes and like the, the jokes about the, uh, the Denny character. Like, oh, and yeah. he's like, he's like, how old is my character? You're a little boy. How Tommy old? keeps calling him little boy. Yeah. Yeah. How old you are now? Um, he's like, well, I'm 26. Like, <laughs> what are you, 15? And so Tommy has no idea. Like yeah. I laugh at parts like that, but those are the parts that are in the movie that are real. Yeah. So the, the movie itself, brought nothing new or interesting or funny to the table. Yeah. The only thing that was funny or interesting or worthwhile from the disaster artist were the elements from the room. Yes. So just go watch the room. I, I think I would give it a mild recommendation if you're a big fan of the room. Because there are some amusing moments that show the making of the room. Uh, but if you don't give a fuck about the room or if you don't like the room, then no. There's like nothing to gain from watching this. I did like James Franco a lot more than I was expecting, so I'll give him some props. But that's about it. So you're going to give him a water bottle? Oh, I get it! Hi, doggy. You know what, Jay? I think I'm really looking forward to retirement. Retirement? That seems pretty far off. I mean, it's not like we have a steady flow of VCR repair work coming in. But I, I meant after the wedding. After the wedding? What does our wedding have to do with your retirement? Well, I mean, you know, you and Mr. Plinkett are starting a new life together. You guys are probably gonna move away or something and, and I'll just go off by myself. Probably find a nice beach somewhere, relax, have some cocktails and, you know, just collect those checks that are gonna be coming in for me. Oh, shit. Oh, it's getting late. I gotta get going. The liquor store is gonna be closing soon and I gotta stock up on beer for tonight. What's tonight? Monday. <laughs>